Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mikkel St. Germain. I am the Director of Parent and Family Engagement, and I want to welcome you all to today's webinar. This is Living at Brown, the summer edition for newly uh, accepted or families and parents of newly accepted students. Uh, we are joining you today from the Brown University campus in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, it is a little bit rainy here, uh, but it looks like the sun is coming out and um, we are all getting prepared to welcome you to campus in August and excited that you're with us today. Um, we have currently a, almost 200 people and uh, climbing joining us today, but before we get started, I would like to give you a few bits of business. Um, the first one is that we have received many questions in advance from all of you during registration, and we'll get to as many of those as possible, but there's still time to enter new questions using the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. We also have closed captions available for you today. If you uh, press the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen, you'll be able to access that. And then we want to make sure that you join us uh, for the dining services website, um, sorry, uh, webinar next week that will take place on Tuesday, July 18th at noon uh, or this same time wherever you are in the world. And then we also have a special session for internationally identified students that will take place on Wednesday morning, uh, July 19th. And that's at a special time, 8 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us wherever you are in the world. So uh, welcome to the class of 2027 and your families. Um, let's get started by introducing uh, my colleagues from Residential Life. We have Brenda Ice, who is the Senior Associate Dean and Senior Director of Residential Life, and Aman Amanda Surgeons, who is the Director of Residential Operations. We're going to start off with a presentation uh, from Dean Ice uh, to go over um, everything you would like to know about residential life at Brown University, uh, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A session. Dean Ice. All right. Thank you, Mikkel. Um, I'm not sure I'll cover everything, but um, I did have access to the questions that you provided in advance and so have worked really hard to try to incorporate as many of those um, inquiries into today's presentation. And I'll just reiterate, if you don't hear me talk about it as part of today's presentation, know that you can use the Q&A feature that is located at the bottom of the screen to ask those questions and we'll work really hard to create space at the end to answer those questions for you. We will go ahead and get started with our presentation. Um, and there we go. And here we are. And so what I would like to be able to cover today, um, um, folks know enough about me here at Brown is that I love a good alliteration. Um, and so we're gonna talk about peas today. Um, and so we're gonna talk about our people um, and the purpose um, when we think about residential life and the residential student experience. We'll talk about the places, um, the process itself, and then be able to do plans. And so when we talk about people, I'll give kind of an overview of our department structure. When you think about purpose, it really is the mission, vision, and values of residential life, what we stand for, and more importantly, how does that translate into the work that we do to support the students that live with us? Uh, places will be just an identifier of where our new students will likely be living um, so that you can have a framing because in part they don't get to select where they're going to live. We want to make sure that you understand that. Uh, we'll spend some time, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about the process of going from the housing questionnaire to actually moving in and kind of talk about that first year experience and then end our presentation with plans and provide you with some key dates um, so that you can start to plan accordingly for at least the fall semester uh, with us. A little bit about the people. Um, I sit in the center here, Senior Director of Residential Life, um, and I have a wonderful team that surrounds me um, and supports the good work that we're doing. Amanda Surgeons is joining us on the call today and serves as our Director of Residential Operations. Um, and it's important to note here, excuse me, she is your point of entry, that while I will lead today's presentation, she then becomes your voice, your face, your connection piece, both for you as students and as families joining when you think about the actual physical housing experience. Um, we couple that with the educational component, which is supported by Scott Helfrich, 
who is our director of residential education. So he is then, if we wanna frame it, he is that beds portion. He is that heads and heart portion, but because we're all leadership, it's all one connected unit that we don't separate and delineate between the two. We think about the whole person, not just the one particular aspect and component of that. Terrence Sanders is the director of our uh, Greek program and theme communities. While not a population or area that, that our new students as first years would have access to, it will be important to know that that is a function of the work that we do of specialized housing and opportunities for students to self-identify um, and select to be a part of those uh, growing um, and storied communities that we have here on campus. And then that the connection piece of that first year experience. And so we're excited that this is the leadership team that guides the practice and premise of what we do in residential life, which is really reshaping and supporting the student experience. The rest of the team, we could not do this um, with just the, the, the directors at the helm. And so this is the rest of the department. Collectively, we are full staff. We have 30 individuals, full-time practitioners who do this work. Um, our residential education side led by Scott really is thinking about the program, the support um, and the things that are happening outside of the classroom. Terrence's area focuses on those specialized communities with that same lens. Um, operations, the big blue area is all of Amanda's. And so that is both thinking about the assignments process and the way in which we do things, but we also have our own facilities team embedded in our program. And this is in, in part designed to create a liaison approach between our offices and that of facilities. We have over 50 residential uh, facilities on campus. And that's a lot to get through. And so we make sure that we have a very collaborative partnership with FM, with our facilities operations coordinators who are always in the building, always attending to the matters and ensuring that it creates the right experience or the type of experience we want our students to have. And so you'll be able to come back to this um, and get to know these individuals throughout the course of the academic year. Uh, we move now into our purpose. And so why do we do what we do and, and then how do we do it? So residential life um, in and of itself has four basic pillars and foundational points that ground the work that we do. Health and well-being, inclusive community, growth and development. And the fourth that's not listed here is operational excellence. I've highlighted these three because these primarily focus on the types of programs and ways that we will support students while they're living with us in residence. So health and well-being is more than the health and wellness units that exist in campus life. We overarchingly agree that it is important for students to feel supported at every stage of their development um, and joining us. And so wellness and health is gonna look differently for each individual student based on uh, their own values and beliefs coming into campus, their own cultural upbringings. And so we wanna honor and recognize that you show up in different places and spaces around that and be able to create the space for that to, to take place. And for us to recognize that being well is more than the physical. Um, and so we're finding ways to get students to talk differently around wellness that isn't about that physical fitness and nutrition um, as a, a particular component. Inclusive community is our way of ensuring that all of the individualized perspectives of the students coming in have a place and space to feel honored and recognized. And so we intentionally, as part of our selection process, do not allow for uh, roommate selections for this reason is that we really want our students to be exposed to something different, something um, that they are um, maybe unaccustomed to experiencing. College is already going to be um, different and exciting in lots of different ways and, and kind of draw some anxiety around that. But I think that's a good anxiety. It's a nervousness about the possibilities. And so wouldn't it be great if you're now exposed to others who are having that same level of anxiety and nervousness, but you get to learn a different perspective about why it's different from them than from you. Um, and so that's what these programs and design um, events that we would host would get us to. And then growth and development for us is recognizing that each student shows up on our pathway a little different. 
Um, and so while we will focus on a first year experience, not everyone is gonna move in that same way. And so we will make sure that we pace appropriately to support students as they find their way and they start to self-identify and develop. We then carry that through for their second, third and fourth year that they're with us, knowing that that changes from year to year, either by the design of the buildings that we provide them or more importantly about the needs that, that our team would provide. We'll now move into probably where we saw most of the questions come in. Where are they gonna live? What are they gonna do? Um, for us, the places is really around our first year experience. And so we have, as I said, 50 residential facilities, but on Brown's campus, we co-locate first years exclusively. After your first year, you have the ability to live in any of the residence halls, and that is where our kind of mixed class selection process takes place. But in the first year, we like to co-locate our uh, incoming class into three distinct locations. And so you will start to hear language if you're a student on the call or families in these uh, parent groups hearing about these quads or particular clusters of buildings. Keeney Quad represents our Archibald Bronson, Everett Polin, and Jameson Mead. Um, and for those of you that may have participated in the ADOC uh, experience in April, that is where we actually hosted the tour. So that is one of those particular communities. The other locations are Pembroke East and Pembroke West. And these are all still traditional first year communities. Um, Morris Champlin, Emery Woolley, New Pembroke is a series one through four. Um, and a please a note here, if there are any transfer uh, families and or transfer students on the call, while it is named first year experience, we have designated uh, two units in New PEM that will be located uh, co-located for our transfer students and then um, dispersed in other available spaces in our upper division units based off of your class year coming into Brown. And then Pembroke West is Andrews, Miller and Metcalf. You can find these on the campus map. You can easily see them clustered, but this is just a quick snapshot of where you will live as a first year student with us. So then you're probably wondering, well, that's great that I know where they're clustered, but what's happening inside the space? Um, we wanna be very transparent and clear as we kind of go through this process. Most, if not all first year students um, will live in doubles and triples. Um, it's important that we kind of normalize this. This is a standard practice here at Brown. Our triples are true triples. Um, we are not converting spaces and moving people into um, converted lounges or things of that nature. We personally, and I can attest to this, it was one of Amanda's first jobs um, after joining us last year was to walk every space and do the appropriate inventory to say, if we're calling it a triple, will it actually meet the design and need of three people occupying the space with all of their stuff and all of our stuff? So the triples are true triples um, to kind of ease any folks' minds. And then the rest of the students likely live in doubles. There are singles that exist in the first year communities, but we wanna be very clear is that not everyone is going to get a single. And in most instances, singles that exist in these buildings are held offline for our community coordinators who I'll talk about in a little bit, or in some instances where we need to um, manage uh, approved uh, housing accommodations or specific religious requests. And we'll talk more about that process a little later. In addition to the room type that exists in the space, all of our residence halls in some way, shape or form have a configuration of a lounge or lounges uh, for community gathering spaces, a kitchen, a community kitchen, um, because we do not have um, apartment style or in-suite kitchen availability in the first year area and laundry facilities. When we think about what's in the room itself, Every student gets a bed and a mattress and they are extra long. Um, and then you get a desk with chair, you're gonna get a closet if it's already built in. And if there is no closet built into the room, then you get an armoire or wardrobe. You get a dresser and then we do provide micro fridges. And so that is a combination of both a microwave and a refrigerator in the room. It is not one per student, it is one per room where all the other amenities are one for every individual that occupies the space. 
Also embedded in these buildings are what we refer to as our community coordinators. Nationally speaking, you may have them referred or referenced as RAs. Our community coordinators, the name is intentional because the idea is that they are bringing people together to build community and a sense of belonging. And so their presence is really one of support and not necessarily that of regulation of behavior. We want to kind of create this community standard and we kind of manage and self-regulate ourselves and community coordinators are there to help you and guide you through that particular process. In addition to having these community coordinators, which are peers, sophomores, juniors, and seniors who go through a selection, um, excuse me, a hiring process and move into the space with us, we also have area coordinators. And these are full-time master level professionals who live in residence with us. Now, while we do not have one per building, they are designated by area. For our first year community, there are four distinct area coordinators that support this particular unit out of a, a team of 10. That doesn't mean that the other six aren't gonna be of value and support to you during your residential experience, but you will grow to know and connect with those four area coordinators a little differently than the rest of that population. Also inside and or near these residential facilities that first years will live in are dining facilities. Um, those of you that will live in Andrews Miller Metcalf, Andrews Commons is an actual dining facility embedded in uh, the base of our residential facility. It is not exclusive to the students who live in Andrews, but it does create this kind of um, immediacy and environment to move right from your residence hall into the dining facility. Other dining facilities are embedded in some of the residence halls um, in our upper division area. And then our main dining facility, the Sharp Refractory, um, is central to campus um, off of Wrist and Quad, which is an upper division unit, um, all still within walking distance. In some instances, there are built-in fitness rooms um, in some of the residence halls that give students a little bit more um, ease and flexibility to kind of get in some wellness practices or workouts. Um, but they also are in walking distance to the Nelson Fitness Center and the other athletic complexes um, that exist here at Brown. Um, we're almost done, and then we can jump into our questions, I promise. Um, we introduced to the first year students um, and actually any new student back in early, uh, about mid-June, the housing questionnaire. And so that was the first step of our process. It was your way to kind of tell us a little bit more about who you are how you plan to live and work in this particular, or live and learn in this particular environment. Um, and then we take that information and do something with it. Um, one of the questions that did come up in, as part of the, the pre-registration was, why so few questions to help in this kind of roommate matching? It is because, and this is where I will kind of age myself in this, I've been doing this work and been in the field for over 25 years. And what we have found is that in placements of students, we can narrow it down to about three or four factors to ensure that we can appropriately place. So that really is about how you plan to use the space of where you live, um, your sleep pattern, and that's both your sleep and awake pattern. Um, and then also smoking um, is, is, a, is a contributor around that. And then the last factor that sometimes doesn't really, um, might hit hard with families is about the cleanliness. And so how do you plan to then keep the condition of your room? If we can narrow that down and match those folks based off those honest decisions and answers and those responses, we tend to get it right 98% of the time. Where we have those touch points and kind of conflicts is where we can go back and ask additional questions and kind of move through that. Um, and when we finish the presentation, Amanda will be able to talk a little bit more about that when things don't go the way we prescribed as part of the questionnaire. But now that the questionnaire is closed, our team is now pouring over those, um, those survey results. Some of it is automated so that we can get um, some quick data, but we do intentionally look through applications to make sure that we've gotten the pairings correct and accurate. That's where the puzzle comes in. Then it's a bit of, does this go here? Who goes there? In addition to the survey results, we're also managing any um, SAS accommodations that would have come in 
any religious requests. And then we also offer special interest community opportunities for our incoming students. And so if you preference wanting to live in a sub free or a, a single sex or in uh, quiet housing, that those kind of factors play in and that becomes the puzzle piecing that we do. Um, and once that is settled, our aim is that by August, or excuse me, yes, by August 1st, you receive your housing notification. Um, and that notification will then provide additional details about where you will live, your mailing address, um, and more importantly, your roommate or roommates. Um, and we will want you to do a few things, including reach out to them and start to have those engaging conversations before you get to this third picture, which is move in. Um, and uh, Amanda, I'm actually going to pause here and have you, if you wouldn't mind, um, just talk a little bit about just overview of move in once they get their assignment, what that kind of between August 1 and August 30 when they get here, how we're working to prepare for their arrival. Sure. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. So once we finish our assignments, we will email every student with their specific assignment. We will tell them how to find out their roommate. And that information will include what to bring, what not to bring, how to sign up for a time slot on when you're going to arrive. That way, not everyone is showing up at 9 a.m. in the morning in the morning of move in. And it will also tell you where to go to get your key. Not everyone is going to go to the same place either. We're trying to spread it out so it's not mass chaos. When you arrive to campus, you'll go to your specific location at your specific time slot. Our staff will be there with your key. They'll be there ready to check you in. There will be staff members assisting you with your items, getting them into our provided bins. Note that not every residence hall has an elevator. So we will want you to come with your strong friends and minimal items. That's why we provide all the heavy stuff for your room. That's why we give a micro fridge. We don't really want you carrying those up the stairs. Um, we'll have staff members providing wayfinding to your residence hall from the key station and really inside the halls, helping you navigate where to go. Um, you'll be able to move in that day. Your family members will be able to help you. And then any outstanding things from orientation, whether it be a floor meeting, that will be promoted. You'll know about that in the emails before you move in. So really, from the moment you get your assignment until you move in, we will be sending you updated information through your Brown email. It's really important to know all of our communication goes to your Brown email. So if you haven't set that up yet, you definitely want to make sure that you have your login information for that and you're ready to go. Brenda, did I miss any move-in? No. Um, okay. I do know that there, there are likely a few in the Q&A that we can always follow up and add any additional questions to that. So thank you, Amanda. Appreciate sure. it. Um, so um, I do not profess to be a singer, um, but I was inspired uh, when we think about this idea of living together. Um, one of the things that came up over and over again in some of the pre-registration questions was this idea of this nervous energy about living with someone new and different for the first time. How, do, how will I get to know them? Some of that is baked in in the housing questionnaire that you filled out by knowing your sleep patterns, your cleanliness habits and condition of room space, when you sleep, when you, um, when you rise. That's the kind of first step for us to figure out. We think we found a good match for you. What we will then want you to do is actively seek out the individual and talk to them. This is a moment where I cannot stress enough, it is important that while your primary interest and desire may be to immediately go to their Instagram or try to find their social media presence and get a sense of who they are, I strongly encourage you to make a call or to do some level of connection where you're talking to the person and in, in their, interacting with them in a way that is meaningful and not necessarily by um, the judgment of what they see on a particular post. That's gonna go a long way um, in kind of that next phase of getting to know all about you. You get to say a little bit more about who you are, um, what you intend to do while you're here at Brown. We want you to have some of those pre-conversations well before you arrive. But even if you have those, we're still gonna provide you 
um, with additional resources to continue through that conversation. Those community coordinators I talked about that live in the residence halls with you are also going to be part of that getting to know you period. They're going to connect you with other people. And so while you and your roommate may know enough about one another, the getting to know you then expands to the floor and the community. And now the CC of your area knows there's six people who actually have done um, that are interested in hiking as a hobby. And so now you can try to get those connections and start to build out your community and create a greater sense of connection and belonging. Um, the getting to hope you like me is that, that uh, mantra of us thinking that we got it right with the roommate pairings. There may be occasionally opportunities where it just simply doesn't work. Um, and we will move through that process either through a roommate contract, which is something we ask all first year, or actually all students to complete within the first week or so of their arrival. And the uh, roommate agreement is really the additional question. So while we may limit to no more than 10 questions in the housing questionnaire, the roommate agreement is really that additional question. So yes, I know that you wake, uh, that you go to bed at 10, but do you use ambient noise is the does the light have to be on how are you a light sleeper those sorts of things come into play where you actually talk about it you might have said you want to use your room as a social space let's talk about that more when we talk about social how social are you how many people do you think might be in the space um, are our beds off limits when we have people over? Those become the conversations that we want you to have. You're going to be in this space for a year with this individual. So let's ask all the questions and get all of that out in the open. Um, and the CC will help you through navigating that uh, housing agreement. When we come into conflict or things aren't working, the first thing we tend to go back to is the agreement. Has something changed in either your course schedule, um, something personally, something happening in your environment that now you need to go back and revisit? And I no longer need to go to bed at 10 because I have late classes, so I'm going to stay up to midnight. Let's actually talk through that to see if that could be an adjustment. If we find that the roommate agreement is exhaustive, then there are instances where we will connect you with that area coordinator and think about alternative housing options. This is where the area coordinator is attuned to the whole community and thinks about placements that other conflicts might be happening and they can start to do those touch points if room changes can in fact happen and talk you through that particular process. Uh, my last slide um, as we move through this is the plans. And so here are just some key dates that we wanna make sure that you're aware of. You'll have access to this presentation at the conclusion of this webinar, and these dates will also be posted on our website um, in the coming week, and then subsequently will show up in that email that Amanda referenced earlier when you get your housing assignment. So note, it, note that by August 1, you're going to have that housing assignment. Move in is the 30th, and new student orientation is the 31st. Um, quick note, orientation sits under the umbrella of residential life, and so you get to see my face and that of Mary Jordan's again after move-in as part of that new student orientation experience that runs from the 31st of August until September 5th, um, which is the culmination of co uh, convocation, and then the first day of classes is September the 6th. Uh, we also wanted to give you a few precursor dates for the remainder of the fall semester that might be helpful as you think about uh, flights and travel arrangements. Family weekend is October 13th through the 15th. The last day of class um, on the books uh, is December 12th. Our residence halls will close on December 22nd, and then we'll reopen on January 21st. And then here's just how you get in touch with us. Um, Amanda and I will put our emails in the um, section for you to have access to, but it may just simply be easier for you to call directly um, and reach out to our main office line to visit our website or to send an email directly to res underscore life at brown.edu. It will make its way to us if you don't necessarily um, email us directly. Our, the point of our main account is to be able to have other staff members be able to triage and support you without having to rely on one in particular individual being the sole source of your information sharing.
that is the presentation, folks. Um, I hope that you found it comprehensive, um, informative, and I am also quite certain that I still didn't answer all the questions that you might have about um, living at Brown. And so this is where I'll turn it back over to you, Mikkel, that we can answer and field any questions that the audience may have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dean Ice. Uh, I always learn something when I see your presentations. I am going to ask the first few to Amanda so I can give you a second to catch your breath. Um, Amanda, we've had a number of questions come in about, and I'm going to group these together, what to bring, what not to bring. Um, if I get there with my student and we need to shop for something, where can I get things? And where can my student get things throughout the year when I'm when I'm not there? If you could go through that a little bit. And I will put some links in the chat um, directing folks to various pages. Perfect. Thank you, Mikkel. We will also send these links in the assignment email. So if you don't remember them, we send them again so you know. So what to bring? Um, we find people overpack a lot. So you don't need everything you're going to use for the entire school year. Remember that there is a break. You are going home in December, typically. So you can get your winter type things done. But students tend to bring bedding for their room, a fan if they want one. My kids use one right by their bed. I don't know. They can't sleep without it on their face. Um, uh, surge protectors so that you have multiple outlets in your room. Um, you know, cool. You are here for academics. So your notebooks, your school um, pens, papers, that kind of thing. But don't forget that you are sharing the space. So I would absolutely communicate with your roommate and find out what each other is bringing. Um, I did see some questions about how to best utilize like storage space. Those under the bed, three stack, three drawer stackables typically fit under a raised bed. Those are good. Those are helpful to bring. But don't forget, you will have a dresser and or a wardrobe where your clothing can go. Um, definitely check out the what to bring list that is in the chat. Restricted items. We get questions every year about can I bring an air conditioner? Because not all of our buildings have air conditioning. You cannot bring an air conditioner because of the electrical load on the building. But I will tell you, there are very few days that you are going to actually even want that air conditioner. So trust me, it would not be worth lugging it up the stairs. Um, we don't allow them unless you have a um, improved need through our student accessibility services office. Um, that is the biggest thing of not to bring. We also see a lot of questions about bed risers and lockers. We don't allow the lockers, um, specifically homemade ones. We do not allow those. The beds do raise to a good level. Um, I'm fairly vertically challenged about five feet and I would have to kind of jump to get up to the highest level. So it does go up enough for you to put things underneath the bed. Um, about where to go when you get here, Providence has access to a lot. There is a Target and a Walmart and um, pretty much a mall within 15 minutes driving and you could take a bus there. So there's plenty of access to anything you might have forgotten or that you might need. We do suggest that you come with your basic bedding and then figure out what, what would work in your setup and then go to either Target, Walmart, one of those places to purchase specifics for your room because there's not a general layout no two rooms are going to look exactly the same depending on the roommate setup and the way you decide to move things around. So it might make sense to wait to actually get the decorative type things for your room. And that's totally possible within 15 minutes from campus. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, a few questions about laundry. Uh, one was I heard laundry is free. Is that true? Um, and then the other is where is where is the laundry facilities located? Um, can you answer those questions? Yes, and I'm very happy that you're already thinking of doing laundry. Your roommates will thank you. Um, there is laundry in every building, and depending on how many residents are in each location, there's either one or more rooms for laundry. And yes, laundry is included in the cost of housing for the foreseeable future. So that is a benefit to all of our students and everyone so far has been very happy with that. We just actually upgraded our laundry system 
And so I think you'll find that it is extremely easy to use with an app feature. Um, and so, yes, it's free. Please do it often. Great, thank you. And uh, I think Dean Ice went over some of the cleaning in the rooms themselves, but there were questions about the bathrooms and the cleaning schedule for the bathrooms. Yes, so we partner with our facilities uh, management and their custodial services. So they do a daily clean. Um, the students are responsible for their own rooms, but within the bathrooms, there is daily cleaning that happens. Right. Thank you. I'm going through these quickly because we have many. Um, some were asking about, and you may have covered this a little bit with storage, but there were a few about, can I bring my own desk chair? And if I do, can I have the one that was assigned to me removed? Is that something that's possible? So we don't have a ton of room for storage. I would suggest getting to campus, figuring out what we offer, um, and then then figuring out with your area coordinator what's possible as far as storage or whatever, because there are some situations where given a medical need or whatever that someone may need to bring in their own chair, for instance. Um, we also don't recommend bringing in anything stuff. Um, it's not necessarily prohibited, but it's not a good idea to bring in stuffed furniture. Our furniture is treated for fire protection and we wanna make sure that we keep that consistent. So I would wait till you get here, talk to your staff in your building, and then decide whether or not it's necessary for you to bring something in, because it may not be available for us to take something out and store it. And so you may be stuck with a cramped environment if you bring your own furniture. Thank you. Uh, one more for you, Amanda, before I go back to Dean Ice. Um, there were a number of questions about moving out for winter break, uh, and then can I stay over through the summer? Um, those details, uh, let's start with winter break and the exam schedule. What plans can families make now in terms of the move out, what's allowed, uh, where are resources to, to find information? Sure, that, those are great questions. If you know you're going home for winter break, you would look at your last exam, which of course right now you don't know. So you could leave after your last exam, but you would need to leave before the residence halls close. So I believe Dean, I said December 22nd is when they close. You can plan on that date, or you can wait until you get your exam schedule, which typically comes out the first few days of classes and base your um, flight or travel information on that. If you know you're gonna need to stay over winter break, the residence halls do close for winter break, but we understand that some students need to stay, maybe taking courses or an internship over the winter. We will put out that information to students in, late October, early November about, and there is an application to stay. We need to know who needs to be here. And there is a cost associated to that. All of that information will come out in the fall semester towards November with the price and the way to apply to stay. So look for that information. Again, it comes to your Brown email. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna shift over to Brenda for a little bit here. Um, Brenda, hopefully you've had a chance to catch your breath. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Um, this is the lightning round. So uh, questions about smoking. Um, it, are the dorms, I think the questions on the, the roommate questionnaire have people thinking about what's allowed in terms of smoking. Sure. So we are a smoke-free campus in residence. Um, and that doesn't mean that students cannot smoke. They cannot smoke in their residence hall, which includes while there is approval for recreational use of uh, marijuana and cannabis in the state of Rhode Island, it still is not permissible in our residence halls. So there is a no smoking policy that exists for Brown and that's in any facility, including our residential spaces. Thank you. Uh, this one is about orientation and the Labor Day weekend in the United States. It's a holiday weekend. Uh, there were some questions about um, do students have any downtime during that that time? Yes. So we are in uh, conversations with Macau to actually create a special orientation webinar that will be launched um, before you all arrive. But the idea is that the schedule we provide is meant to be both in, informative and supportive. And the su supportive piece is recognizing that they don't always need to be on. And so we will create down times or the flexibility of those sessions being optional so that students can tap out when and if they need to um, based off the particular um, 
presentation that we have. So for one example, we're offering a target run. Um, and so students have the ability to hop on one of our, our buses and head into Target to pick up um, any last minute items that they didn't grab or finally get that desk chair that they wanted to grab, um, they couldn't fit in the car or whatever it might be. Um, but if you've already gotten all your stuff, we're not gonna say that's the only thing you can do. So we create some alternative or optional programming or that kind of downtime. Um, it will be a lot and we recognize that, which is why we are, we are streaming, streamlining our approach to orientation and making sure that the information and sessions that we provide are critical for the first few days of your experience on campus. And then we slowly um, introduce all other resources so it feels like a year long experience than a five day experience. Great, thank you. And along similar lines, um, there is a substance free dorm. Can you talk about the policies and the, um, the uh, procedure to be assigned to substance free dorm? Sure. So as part of that questionnaire that students would have entered into um, substance free um, community or those that are ex that have expressed interest in not wanting to be involved and or around substance use at all. And that is not us endorsing that it's going to exist. It's just recognizing that it is a college environment and it may exist. Those that are designated and assigned to a substance free community will be surrounded by others of a like-minded interest. And so that there is where they can create that sense of affinity and feel like there's a, a safety in being surrounded by that supportive community in our first year area. For upper division students, we do have a substance recovery community that tends to partner sometimes with our substance free students in our first year area that we certainly can support and connect students with. Um, one of the expectations that is simply out there, which would be coordinated by your community coordinator and area coordinator, is that you just simply agree to live to the expectations that we put forward on the application, is that you said you wanted to be a part of this community for this reason, and so we just ask that you honor it. And when you find that you or others in the community are in conflict, immediately raise that with our area coordinator, and we can figure out what we might be able to do to um, manage the behavior, stop the behavior, or figure out a different solution for the students that are impacted. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk about security in the dorms? Sure. Um, we have um, a two, a, a, let's say for entry into the spaces, there's a two pronged approach. All of our residence halls have card readers to gain entrance into the facilities. And so your student ID serves as a kind of your guide and, and ticket around campus. It's gonna get you into your residence hall it's also used for your dining um, meal plan that you have access to. It would allow you to utilize our laundry facilities, um, your declining balance, use at the bookstore, all of those functions. But initially it will get you into your building. Our systems are designed that you only have access to the building of which you're assigned. So we do not provide full residential access for all students. Um, that creates that additional bonus and security measure for us to say that we can at least attend that those assigned to those buildings should be the only ones entering in the space. Your rooms interior to that space are keyed. And so we actually issue a hard key for every student that's assigned to that particular space. Um, for as much as we have that in place, um, we also, I like to frame and remind folks that the space is only as safe as our students make it. And so this is where we really go back to the sense of community. We want you to know your roommate. We want you to know the people who live next to you, who live on the floor, who live in the building, so that you can create a greater awareness when things feel out of sorts um, or that you see or feel like something else might be happening. We do believe that it's important for you to say something the moment you see something. Our community coordinators are positioned along the hallways um, for them to be able to do the appropriate response as needed. We have a wonderful partnership with our Department of Public Safety um, and working to figure out how we can increase and enhance their community walks when they are around our, our spaces. Um, exterior, rarely are they doing those interior community walks that is really designed for the community coordinators to kind of create that additional presence in the space. 
Cameras do exist on our campus, but they are managed by DPS and more of a exterior um, sense of support um, as another um, added security bonus, but there are no interior cameras in the buildings or in hallways, in student rooms, bathrooms, none of that. Um, we really wanna get to this kind of community um, standard and kind of advocacy for ourselves um, and manage the security and safety of our students that way. Thank you. A uh, few quick ones about move-in dates and procedures. Um, we've got had a number of questions from uh, folks who have athletes, uh, student athletes in their family. Are there different move-in dates for them and what's the best way for them to get that information? Sure. So as part of that um, housing notification that you're going to get um, on or before August 1st, will be information about our early arrival process. We recognize that not everyone is coming on August 30th. And so if you are um, arriving early for um, a varsity sport preseason training um, and practices, if you're part of a pre-orientation program, if you are an international student who uh, needs uh, has some flight or travel restrictions or any student along that line, we will create opportunities for you to arrive early. You may not have the same August 30th experience if you come in on the 11th, but it doesn't mean we're still not going to welcome you. We're going to figure out who is sponsoring you and bringing you into that space and make sure that they recognize that you're here, get you connected. Um, by the time our early arrivals come in, um, we will already have our community coordinators back in training, and so you'll have some kind of welcoming environment. And then the other piece I want to emphasize is that we then encourage you that even though you've moved in, say, on August 17th, we still want you to move in on the 30th. That is our official welcome for every student coming in, and we want to make sure that you get the same treatment as those that show, uh, that are deciding to come a little later and not wrapped up in any of the pre-orientation arrival processes. But we wanna make it as welcoming as possible. You may, may just not get the balloon fair, fair, fanfare on the 11th, but we promise you'll get it on the 30th. And along similar lines, uh, is the process for transfer students moving in the same as for new, uh, for new first year students? Yes. So the. The move-in is designed for all new students, so that does capture our transfer students as well. Um, in As part of our orientation webinar that we'll provide, um, we will ask our um, colleague who oversees our transfer orientation to either provide us with information that we can share or maybe even join that webinar because there will be a different track um, and opportunities that our transfer students will go through that don't necessarily um, connect or part of that first year experience. But everyone that is new to Brown for the first time this fall will join us on August 30th. Great, and a uh, partner question to that, is there a day where they need to be completely finished moving in? I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. And I, I'm not sure if that means like, uh, when you have to say goodbye to your kids, but uh... that may be, and, and I might have you answer that. But August thirtieth is move in. It is not orientation. It is not anything other than a residential life experience for you to spend the day getting in and getting comfortable in your space. There will be a moment at some point where we say students have to eat. Students have to attend their first floor meeting. If that's what you're looking for, then it's five o'clock. Okay, and that's a good segue for me, for me to talk about the parent welcome. Uh, we do have a, a welcome for families who are still here on campus at five o'clock when the students go off to eat um, that you'll be getting information about uh, on August 1st. Uh, that'll be sent to everyone. Um, and then we follow it up with a full day of programming for parents and families on August 31st, which runs from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, it's not mandatory and there'll be virtual options for those who aren't able to be here on campus or cannot stay that long. So don't feel um, like you're missing out if you if you aren't able to attend, but we would love you to attend if you are still uh, on campus. And as Brenda mentioned before, we have family weekend coming up too. Uh, so that will allow us another chance to, to engage with you. Um, I've got a few more. Uh, about the dorms themselves, um, maybe Amanda, we can switch this over to you. Uh, again, 
we um, had a few about uh, shipping to the dorms ahead of move-in. Is that an option? So students will receive their mailbox number and that number stays with them through their entirety, um, their whole career at Brown. Once they receive that number, they can start having items shipped to them. So I, I actually don't know when that gets sent. Brenda, do you know when that gets sent? Sure. So as part of your housing portal, you'll see your profile. Your mailing address will be included on ours. Mail services sends an independent message, but they ask that you wait until one week before you actually arrive to start shipping your, your items. They will then store in their appropriate warehouses and start to catalog all of the um, pre-arrival uh, packages. And then on move-in day, once you have picked up keys and started to move into the room, their operations will be open um, on move-in day through all of orientation for you to go over and manage those packages that may be there. In some instances, when they have a full staff, they have been known to actually manage a, a courier service and actually get the items to the space. I don't know that that is still a practice, um, but at minimum, at least one week prior to student arrival, you can start to ship those items so that they're waiting there for you and you don't have to then overload the vehicle. Great, thank you. And um, a question about what type of flooring is in the dorms? So- that, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that varies. Um, and so what we are moving towards is this kind of LVT or laminate flooring to make sure that it can both support students in their aesthetic if they're thinking about bringing rugs or that sort of thing, but also thinking more proactively about allergens and making it more um, appropriate for students to feel like they have um, they don't have to make special accommodation requests for a type of flooring that we move to a standard. That doesn't mean that all spaces won't still have carpeting, um, but most in most of our spaces, carpeting exists in common area spaces and in areas leading up to the individual rooms. Um, there may be one or two buildings in our first year areas where there might be carpet in the room, but most have this kind of laminate flooring, um, both to support that kind of allergen-free environment where we can, but it also is a cleaning aspect that it's easier to clean than a laminate floor than you feeling like one of the things you need to purchase is a vacuum cleaner um, to clean a carpet. If it doesn't exist in your room, that's one more thing you don't need to bring to campus. Thank you. And um, are families allowed inside the dorms? Oh, of course. Um, we encourage it because our volunteers only get you to the door you have to be there to assist and help with the unpacking. Um, for the families on the call, move-in day is as much your experience as it is the students. And so we want you to be a part of that um, and um, participate in that process. We will tell you though, that on move-in day, we will give the key and access to the student. So families joining, don't stand in line while someone else goes off and shuttles and does what they need to do. We do wanna make sure for our purposes that we're issuing the key to the student who will occupy the space. Um, and at that point, then the whole family and those that you came with um, can head on up to the room um, and start the unpacking process. Right, another one that just came in, where is the mail room located in relation to the dorms? So the mail room is located in Paige Robinson, um, which is also um, kind of a central hub. It's not our student center, but it is the next building past the student center um, where students have access to be able to um, not only receive their mail, but they actually operate. I won't say it's a full postal service, but they actually do provide additional mail services um, that exist. When we send our communication, we'll include links to their website, uh, but they will also send independent information about the services they provide, including package pickup and delivery. All right. Um, I think I'm going to start to wrap this up a little bit. First, by saying that if we did not answer your question specifically, please reach out to my office at family at brown.edu. And I'm happy to get your question to the right area. Uh, if it is specific to residential life, um, Brenda, where is the best place for them to contact you? Um, so we're gonna tell you to start with our main account and I'll put it in the chat. It's res underscore life 
at brown.edu, but I will always take an email. And so you can find me. Mine is Brenda underscore ICE, I-C-E. And yes, I am the coolest person you will ever meet. Um, and then Amanda's is the same kind of nomenclature, Amanda underscore surgeons at brown.edu. Any one of us, um, including our main account, we will be responsive. We will get you the answers that you need. You can always pick up the phone and also make the call. Our website is updated daily as we start to make these communication efforts. And so you'll start to see more information showing up in preparation for your arrival and move in that you can find it there as well.